Congratulations on your purchase of the Sniper EFI system. The Sniper EFI system is compatible with several popular ignition combinations, and in this video I'm going to show you how to properly wire and set up the system for a Holley dual sync distributor using the ECU for timing control. All timing advance or retard functions will be performed by the ECU. This ignition option starts with a Holley dual sync distributor, a dual sync adapter, part number 558-493, a sniper coil driver module, or a CD ignition box and a compatible coil. The ECU needs to receive a clean input signal, and vehicles that have excessive electromagnetic interference, come referred to as EMI or RF noise issues, can compromise these signals as well as other control circuits resulting in poor performance and drivability issues. Proper grounds, spark plugs, Ignition wires and wire routing are going to be critical for trouble-free operation. Non-resistor spark plugs and solid core wires may have worked with your carburetor, but they will not work with EFI. A common sign of trouble is if your radio whines when you have the engine running. If you have EMI or RF issues, these need to be corrected. Before we dive into the mechanical side of the installation, we need to program the ECU for the proper ignition type. From the setup wizard, the ignition setup icon or the PC software, you want to select Holly Dual Sync as your ignition type. If you're manually setting it up, the reference angle should be set to 50, the inductive delay set to 100, and the dwell should be set to 2 milliseconds. Now that that's complete, let's dive into the mechanical part of the installation. With our ignition type properly programmed in the ECU, our fuel pump relay removed, and our negative battery terminal disconnected, we need to properly install and phase our new Holly dual sync distributor. In order to do that, one of the first things you need to do is set the crankshaft at 50 degrees before top dead center on a compression stroke. It's important to make sure that you're on the compression stroke. One of the easiest ways to do this is to remove the number one spark plug, put your finger in the hole, and pull the engine around. And when you feel pressure, you know you're on a compression stroke. Another method you could use is what they call a top dead center whistle. In a lot of instances, this is really my preferred method because it allows you to do a couple things. Not only does it allow you to confirm when you're on a compression stroke, it's a quick way to validate that when you bring it to top dead center, you're actually where you want to be. Over the years, I've seen a lot of mismatched timing pointers and balancers, as well as old balancers that the elastomer's kind of broken down and the shell's turned and it's not set up correctly. So when you think that you have your time inaccurate, it's really someplace different. So this, you simply screw in place of your number one spark plug. And as you rotate the crankshaft in the direction of rotation, it'll actually whistle. When you get to the zero top dead center mark, it'll actually stop. In this case, we can look and we can see that we're validated at top dead center. Now that we've confirmed top dead center, we're going to want to turn the crank to 50 degrees before top dead center. Now your balancer may not be indexed or marked. If it's not, don't worry about it. You can simply take a little bit of math and you can determine from your top dead center out to your 50 degrees. What you would do is you take your balancer diameter, you would multiply the diameter times 3.14, divide that total by 360, and then multiply that times 50, and that will give you the distance that you need to measure from the zero mark. If you don't want to do the math, we've kind of made it a little bit easier for you. You can look at this chart that we have here, and it shows common distances for a lot of your popular balancer diameters. Or you can always do the math with the formula listed below. What you can do from that point is you can take a tape measure and measure it, or what I like to use is a piece of masking tape. So I've already marked this out. And you can simply line up the zero mark at top dead center and wrap it around your balancer and you'll get your 50 degree mark. From that point, you're going to want to rotate the crankshaft in the direction of rotation until you get to your 50 degree mark on your balancer. From here, we can proceed with removing your old distributor if you haven't already done so and installing the new distributor. If you're removing an old distributor, one of the things you want to do before you completely remove it is take a little bit of compressed air 
and blow out any debris that may be down in the valley, the intake manifold around the distributor body. The last thing you want to do is have debris fall in your engine when you pull the old distributor out. Now that we have our old distributor removed, we can go ahead and proceed with installing our new Holly dual sink. Before you just drop this thing and lock it down, there's a couple things you want to check first. The first things you want to do is install the distributor without any gaskets. Just dry fit it, lock it in place, and make sure that it fully seats and touches the mating surface. If for any reason it's up, that's going to indicate that the distributor is bottoming it out, usually in the oil pump drive, and that needs to be resolved before you proceed. Common things that would cause this would be if the intake manifold, the cylinder heads, or the engine block have ever been machined down, if they've been decked and resurfaced, it's going to reduce some of these tolerances in here, and it could create a bottom-out situation and a gap. If you've got a small block or big block Chevrolet, you could use Holly Dulcing part number 565-104, and that's a distributor that actually has an adjustable slip collar to give you some room for adjustment. If your distributor doesn't have an adjustable collar, one of the simple things you could do a lot of times to rectify is just double up on your distributor gaskets because it'll basically act like a shim to resolve that situation. Once you've confirmed that you can properly seat the distributor, you're going to want to go ahead and coat the gear with a generous amount of Molly Lube if it's not going to be restarted right away or if it's a new installation or if for some reason it's been run in before and it's been mated to the cam and you're going to start the engine pretty soon, you can go ahead and just coat that with a liberal amount of compatible engine oil. Make sure that the gear is compatible with your camshaft. Some camshaft require a bronze gear, and if you mix and match it, you're going to have some issues with damage in that camshaft. If you're not sure what gear you need, contact your cam manufacturer for their recommendation. Once you have all of the compatibility confirmed and you're ready to install it, put your gasket on, and go ahead and drop the distributor down in place. Pay attention to the orientation of your rotor contact. When you install it, you're going to want to have that aligned in the general vicinity that you want the number one tower to be. If it's not pointing where you want it, simply pick the distributor up and you can rotate it out and line it up where you want it to be. From this point, you want to look at the distributor body and rotate it until you find the little black sensor that's held on the Phillips head screw. This is your crank sensor. You're going to want to align that with the rotor contact. If for some reason when you go to install the distributor something on the body hits, don't get too worried about it. You can always pick the distributor body out, rotate it to the spot that you have clearance, and reinstall it and then line that back up again. Once you get that lined up, go ahead and take your distributor hole down, reinstall it, but you don't have to get real tight on it. Just put it in there finger tight because you're still going to need to be able to move that distributor body a little bit. With that snug down finger tight, you want to get your dual sink distributor adapter. There's going to be two pigtails sticking out of it. There's going to be a loose pink wire. That loose pink wire needs to be wired to a switched ignition source. It needs to be hot when the key is in run as well as crank. Be careful not to accidentally wire that to the accessory side of your ignition switch, otherwise it'll actually shut off when you try to start the engine, and we know that isn't going to work out in your favor. The other connector that you're going to need to hook up is going to have a green and a purple wire, and they're going to be marked crank input positive and crank input negative. On the harness coming out of your sniper system, you will find a mating connector with light color wires. You just want to go ahead and install that securely make sure it's nice and tight. The large connector will plug directly into your dual sync distributor. Once you have it to this point, go ahead and reconnect your negative battery terminal. Make sure you leave that fuel pump relay out at this time. Just hook up the battery again. and Go ahead and turn your ignition on and we're going to do a little bit of setup. So with our ignition on, if you've dropped the distributor improperly, you're going to see that you have two LEDs that are lit. The LED that we're going to be focused on is going to be the one closest to the black crank sensor. If your engine rotor or distributor rotor rotates clockwise, you want to slowly turn the housing clockwise until you see the LED turn off and then slowly rotate it back to where it just comes on. At this point, you can go ahead and lock that distributor down. If your engine rotor rotates counterclockwise, you would do it in the same fashion. 
except for you would turn the housing counterclockwise until the LED goes off and then turn it back clockwise to where it just comes on. These sniper instructions have detailed illustrations and step-by-steps that go a little bit further into this. Once you're happy with the way the phasing is, you have your LEDs lit, go ahead and shut off your ignition and you can reinstall your distributor cap at this time. When you install the distributor cap, sure do you have the detents properly aligned and you'll notice that I cut a picture window in this cap and you'll see that it does orient with our rotor which is going to indicate that this is going to be my number one terminal when I put my ignition wires back on. At this time it would be a good idea to go pick up a fresh set of ignition wires and spark plugs. If you got an older set, no use putting them back on, eliminate any potential hassles or trouble you may have out of it, just put a fresh set on while you're at it. Now that our distributor is installed, we need to finish up a couple small steps in the wiring. You'll want to locate the solid white wire that's coming out of the input-output harness of your sniper system. If you look at it closely, it'll be marked points output. This is the output trigger wire that you're going to use to either trigger your capacitive discharge ignition box or your sniper coil driver module. If you're installing it through the sniper coil driver module, you will find a white wire and you simply would connect it. In the case of our 6425 MSD Digital 6AL box, it also has a white point input trigger wire and if we were going to be utilizing the Digital 6, we would connect it. Most CD ignition boxes use a white wire for the point input trigger, but don't assume that that's always going to be the case. Always read the instructions supplied by the manufacturer of your ignition control box to make sure that you're wiring it up correctly. Once that's connected, depending on the ignition type, we need to hook up our coil. With a digital 6AL, we have an orange wire and a black wire that come directly from the box. The orange wire would go to the positive side of our coil, and the black wire would go to the negative side. When you're dealing with a CD ignition box, never, under any circumstances, hook the solid yellow wire up. This is for a totally different type of ignition. If you hook it up to the tack output or to the coil, you're guaranteed that you're going to destroy your ECU, so just don't do it. If you're using the coil driver module, the positive side of the coil would be wired to a switched ignition source and the gray output trigger wire would simply go to the negative side of the coil. At this point, we're ready for some additional pre-startup checks. We're going to go back over to the car and we're going to run through a few of those and we'll have this thing running in no time. Before we try to start this engine, we want to do some pre-start checks. One of the things we want to do is confirm that we not only have the distributor synced correctly, we want to make sure it's wired properly, and also we want to make sure that it is set up properly in the ECU. To make sure that it's properly wired and properly set up, we're going to go ahead and look at our monitor on our handheld and pull up one of the values that says RPM, and with just the key on it should say stall. When we crank it, it should show RPM if everything was done properly. So it's showing RPM, so we know that we have it wired correctly and set up properly. At this point, we want to go ahead and check our timing. We want to make sure that it is phased correctly. One of the ways to do that is we want to enable a static timing check. So we can go back out to our home screen, and we will go under Tuning, System, and Static Timing. At this point, we can program in a value. I usually like to use 15 degrees, so we can adjust our slider over and then fine-tune it with the arrows to 15 degrees, and we want to hit set. At this point, we're going to get out, and we're going to check it with the timing light and make sure that it's at 15 degrees. If you shut the ignition off for any reason, as a note, keep in mind that when you do that, it will actually clear this out automatically. So if you shut the ignition off before you do your static timing check, you're going to need to go in and reset it. So with it set at this point, we're going to go ahead and we're going to check the initial cranking time and we're going to make sure that it's at 15 degrees. We've got our static timing check set at 15 degrees in our software or our handheld. Now we just need to double check that timing. 
by just cranking it over while we still have the fuel pump relay removed. You go ahead and crank it. All right. So our timing's at 15 degrees. We're right where we need to be. If you find that when you crank it over, the timing is off a little bit, just make very small adjustments to the distributor as required to make sure that that's at 15 degrees. We got that set up. We can go ahead and reinstall our fuel pump relay. We'll try to get this thing started. With the fuel pump relay reinstalled, we're going to reset our static timing check to 15 degrees. We're going to try to start the engine. We're going to confirm where the timing is. Go ahead and try to start it. Go ahead and bring the RPM up a little bit. Hey, so you may be wondering why we checked the timing that had my buddy rev the engine up a little bit. We're going to explain that to you. We checked it initially at an idle, and I confirmed that my timing was at my 15 degrees where we set our static timing check. And I had him rev the engine up safely as high as he could generally go, and I wanted to make sure that my timing didn't move at higher RPM. If you see that the timing shifts from the static set point at higher RPM, that can be corrected by changing the inductive delay setting in the handheld or in the software. You wouldn't want to change that in units greater than 20, and then you can fine tune it down. If you find at higher RPM that the timing retarded, you'd want to go in and increase that value. If you found that the timing was over advanced, you'd want to decrease the inductive delay. You want to make sure that if you make changes to the inductive delay that you cycle the ignition off and back on before you check the timing. If you don't cycle the ignition, those settings won't take effect. The other thing to remember is if you shut the ignition off and back on, you're going to need to go in and reset that static timing check because it clears when you cycle the ignition off. If you find that your timing varies when you free rev the engine, you're going to need to go in and correct that utilizing the inductive delay. If you make changes to the inductive delay, you're going to have to shut the ignition off and back on for those changes to take effect. If you find that the timing is retarded, you're going to need to go in and actually advance the inductive delay setting and you need to increase it. If you find that it's advancing at higher RPM, you're going to need to go in and reduce that value. I recommend changing that value in units no greater than 20 and then you can fine tune it as required based on your engine combination. The base settings in the software are pretty close and you usually don't need to change those, but as we know, every engine combination is different and you may need to go in and modify those and we give you the ability to do that. If you shut the ignition off and back on, one thing to keep note of is that you will clear out your static timing check. Once that clears, you will need to go in and reset that before you check your timing again. Once you're happy with it, you can go in and program your timing curve as required for your engine combination. It's important to double check this and make sure your timing's right because the last thing you want to do is detonate the engine. It may seem like a lot of redundant checks, but it's worth every second that you spend doing it. Once you're happy with your timing setup, it's time to go out and drive the car and enjoy the new benefits you have of computer-controlled timing.